Hello everyone, this is Mirko Guerrini and I welcome you to the Jazz Transcription Clinic, a monthly interviews podcast where we talk with accomplished jazz doctors about their lives, career and their personal secrets on the art of transcribing. If you want to improve at jazz, stay tuned and follow the Jazz Transcription Clinic on the socials for more content. I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which this podcast is being recorded. I pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and the Aboriginal elders of other communities who may be here today. Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of the Jazz Transcription Clinic. And today our guest doctor is Roberta Gambarini. And I'm really honored to have Roberta part of this podcast. Yes, Roberta is a two times Grammy nominated singer. Uh, she has uh, been one of the runners up in the 1998 Thelonious Monk competition. And take that, you know, as an introduction. Uh, she has performed everywhere uh, around the world, including at Carnegie Hall, the Kennedy Center, Hollywood Bowl, Jazz at the Lincoln Center, and many, many others. And the list of names, you know, that uh, she has performed with is so incredible. I'm, I'm so jealous and amazed. I could go on for like hours in naming, but just to name a few, like James Moody, Hank Jones, Clark Terry, Dave Brabeck, Herbie Hancock, Michael and Randy Brecker, Jimmy Heath, Roy Hargrove, Jimmy Cobb, etc., etc., etc. Roberta, since she moved to New York in 1998, she has been one of the voices in uh, jazz music, and she has won several, several prizes, and you can find her recordings uh, everywhere in the web, but I'll make sure that I'll put all the description and links in the podcast des- description so you can follow Roberta's work and uh, support her with buying her music, for example. So welcome, Roberta, and thanks again so much for being part of this. Oh, thank you for inviting me, and thank you for the beautiful introduction. Wow, gotcha. <laughs> No, th- thank you. Thank you. It really means a lot to uh, have this conversation today with you. Um, so this is all about transcriptions. And it happened that one of my uh, previous guests uh, have mentioned you uh, as one of the best transcribers around in the circuit. And so I never had a chance to meet with you, uh, even if, you know, we are both Italian and I'm pretty sure we have hundreds of common friends. Um, but uh, I tried to, to write to you and you were really humble and uh, happy to participate in this. So uh, I th- I'm really excited to have you here talking about transcriptions. Um, so if you um, are happy, I can start with the first question. Sure, to you. go ahead. So, Roberta, if you transcribe, why you do so? That's a great question. I was hoping you would ask that. Because, <laughs> wow. you know, there's different, different motivations for different people. And my motivations are, are specific to me being a singer, and also to me being a person who, whose most effective uh, way to relate to music is through listening, through, through the ear. That's very important to me. So, um, well, I've, first of all, I've been listening to jazz since I was very little. My parents were uh, am- jazz amateurs, jazz fans. My father was an amateur tenor saxophonist like you, <laughs> but, un- <laughs> but unlike you, he could not have a, a full career, you know, it was, it was rough, but he remained a big fan and he even used to practice his uh, tenor sax. I still have his saxophone, by the way, and at home. And most of all, the, um, the collection of records he had, because he loved also to collect 
uh, albums, vinyls at the time, uh, was a fairly nice collection and was the kind of music that I was exposed to since I was born, basically. That was what was played in my household. So I started listening to this music and to the horns and to singers and big bands since I was very little before, before even I knew the word jazz, you know, at, at a pre, <laughs> pre-conscious level. And it was so a sort was, of imprinting that you yeah. received. Yes, yes, absolutely. So when I grew up, you know, I started to sing in a, in a, in a funny and almost casual way because um, I used to listen to, to jazz and I loved to sing. There you go. That's probably the root of it. I, love, I, loved, I used to love to sing on the albums when I, since I, when I was very little. But I was, in, it was, I was at a pre-conscious level. So for me, it was music. So I would just... Uh, I didn't know that was a solo by Clark Terry or that was the scat solo of Ella Fisher. I just would sing. Yeah. And some of those solos, um, I still remember now. Because like the Ella Fitzgerald solo, just a few bars, but I'll never forget that. On Satin Doll, on um, Ella Sings, the Duke Ellington songbook. Yeah. It was a... I remember that. <laughs> some of it right. I remember probably till the day I die. But That's that was instinctive, you know, and yeah. some solos. So I started singing almost per chance because my parents were volunteering in a jazz club in northern Italy. They were, they were helping. A lot of the greats would come and play there. So I was exposed to even this type of live. It was a cultural association, so there was not, you know, it was a kind of a relatively safe environment to to bring on a, a child <laughs> yeah. and so I got to to hear and see a lot of musicians and um, it was a volunteer organization and they had um, a local rhythm section I, and I kept going there and listening and, and they knew I loved to sing along I was a little bit older at the time I was already adolescent it was, but uh, so this this people who had this um, this uh, local rhythm section, they had the idea of having me join them for something. And I was absolutely crazy because I, <laughs> I wanted to sing Night in Tunisia, you know, but I was completely raw. You know, I had some music lessons when I was uh, 12. Um, but I don't want to talk too much about that. I'm going to go st- strictly to the transcription. But... So that's that. That for me was it. So just learning tunes by ear, learning solos by ear, singing along with the recordings. That was my first um, degree of education. That's so that's just, great. Sorry for interrupting because uh, uh, probably you don't know, but my father was a clarinet and saxophone player oh. too, and he used to play uh, for few years, uh, late 50s, he used to play on a cruise ship that was uh-huh. going to New York. So, and they were spending like two weeks in New York each trip. So he, it happened that he listened to everyone, you know. Oh, live. wow, that's really good news. And, <laughs> yeah, and he was buying all the vinyls that were released, yeah. you know, just freshly released, like a kind of blue, you know, imagine that. Yeah. And he was transcribing using a tape, but I inherited, you know, that huge vinyl collection. And I remember I, I was studying classical music at the conservatorium and my introduction on jazz was absolutely random because my father didn't want me to go into jazz. He wanted me to be a classical musician. Uh, so he locked up all the jazz vinyls and I one day I discovered I was alone at home I was probably 14 I discovered this vinyl collection and I they were in alphabetical order and the first one I took out was at Blakey and the Jazz Messengers live wow. at Olympia so wow. I put 
put on the recording and the first track is Are You Real with Benny, Benny Gosson. Gosson. Yes. And that was like getting a virus, right? Yeah. It was like, <laughs> Why you know, it, what? it was it. I couldn't. And my dad came back home and I said, what are you doing? And I said, what is, what is this? Dad, what is this? I never heard a note of jazz before. Wow. So it was like, wow. Oh. And I started, as you, as you said, you know, I started just listening and listening and try to find the notes yeah. of that because I was catched by, by the sound of it. This, you know, yeah. so fluid tenor sound. It was like, whoa, yeah. what is that? So, yeah, there is a bit of, you know, common yeah. stuff there. So you touched on an important thing that also ties to the topic of the trans uh, of the transcription is the topic of sound so what what attracted me to um uh, you know to wanting to to listen more and more was the sound the sound and the rhythm so those are the very attractive elements for me were always always were since i was very young to wanting to know more about about it um sing more of it, you know, sing along more with it. it was, this is the, the attraction. It was not the concept of transcription because I didn't even know what it was. It was just the attraction to sound and, and rhythm and, yeah. Yeah. and just but, you know, wanting to dive in. I wanted to, you know, like make a dive into the vinyl <laughs> and dance on the grooves. <laughs> and when did you start to do it consciously, like to do it? And you, you thought, I want to learn this because I can learn this. Mm -hmm. So, first of all, I didn't know that there was a style called vocalese. I used to listen to Lambert Hendricks and Ross when I was little, but I thought they were songs. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, John Coltrane, John Coltrane, really loves his cousin Mary. And I, I studied English at a very young age. So, you know, I was also attracted to... to the fact that they were kind of telling stories, you know, it was, it was not, and you know, my, my father loved uh, Count Basie a lot. So we had the uh, sing a song of Basie. And when I was, uh, I think I was 11 or 12, I could already understand English. So in the back of the old, on the back of the old um, cover, there were all the lyrics, you know, for all that album, sing a song. And so I would look at that. It was so fascinating. And um, so, but I started first getting, getting used to this world of, um, you know, Lambert Hendricks and Ross, and then I went to Edge Jefferson, and then I, I wanted to sing the solos the way they would sing it. You know, for me, it was also a, a way of singing. You know, Eddie Jefferson and the, the sound, the rhythm, the words, the way the words were popping in them and were swinging. So I really started, think, approaching the transcription from that standpoint, seeing and listening to other people singing solos, a lot of the masters, you know, yeah. uh, Moody's Mood for Love. Sort of. yeah. And so later on, when I was, I think the first time I did the transcription, I did a transcription with the purpose of, of uh, it being a, a creative thing or wanting to do my own transcriptions in order to do that, to do vocalese, but with the solos that meant to me. That's the point. Okay. So, of course, you know, I, I knew um, Twisted, you know, oh, no, all, the, all the famous, you know, Farmer's Market, all the classics of Moody's Mood for Love. And so I was, um, I was already 18. I had already started singing. So, um, so I thought rather than um, reproducing the great solos, you know, I love Cloud Burst, you know, I was crazy for John Hendrix. And, but at some point I thought, and I was already doing gigs, and I said, no, I want to I wanna write my own, you know, do my own thing, you know on that tradition but i wanted to do it with solos because for me it was very 
important. See, I, I knew that Twisted was a solo of Wardell Gray. Actually, I had heard the solo of Wardell Gray. So, and I knew, I knew those at that point, when I was that age, you know, late in my teens, I knew that those were solos of the greats and I hadn't heard the music of the greats. So, yeah, so I was, I think I was 17 or 18 when I started, you know, thinking, okay, I'm gonna... So, I started thinking of solos and recordings that really meant to me. Like stuff that really, not just I liked them because they were, they were, beautiful solos because otherwise it would be lost or a million. But I, I went and picked the one that really meant for me on a personal level. And so yeah. on. And this was basically your already reply to the third question, which was oh. uh, how do you choose the solos you are going to transcribe? So that's totally fine and understandable. Um, the, the second question is, what do you expect to bring home from uh, the solos you transcribe? So do you do it because you know that you can learn something specific or you just love that solo so much that you want to be able to sing it? Yeah, both. And it's the same thing because I love the solo. I want to be able to sing it. But in order to be able to sing it, I have to listen to it and understanding it and learn it and study it. <laughs> That's what studying is. And so, but I want it to be, but the, the reason why I do it for myself, then we'll talk about it when I ended up doing it for a living. That, that, yeah. that <laughs> just happened. So, but yeah. but the, the reason why I... I wanted so much to do it for myself, and, and it, I was so inspired. It was so inspiring. Is um, I wanted to um, find a way to express myself and the love I have for this music through diving into this style called vocalies, and so it becomes the the solos tell a story. We know so. Um, I had read also some interviews of John Hendrix, which says a very nice thing. So he says, he says, solos tell a story. And he was saying that about Sing a Song of Basie with Lambert Hendrix and Ross. He said, I, I conceived then what I do as almost a little theater piece. And so I, Im I imagine um, the trumpet saying something and dialoguing with the, with the saxophones. But that's what music is about. Music is communication. And I think that's why um, his work is so communicative, because it's not just about, I take down some notes, you know, it's, it's, it's different. And there are so many more things than notes when you transcribe. Here's another long thing that probably we should talk about, because yes. transcribing yes. does not mean um, hearing pitches and then writing them on paper. That's not, that's not it. It's nothing. But. To me, <laughs> that is the start of the work. So it's like a precondition. So getting the pitch, the rhythm, and if you want, write it down on a paper, that's before you even start studying that solo. Exactly. Uh, which is also not necessary. You know, a lot of times I just learn it from memory. I don't write it down. So I, in these days, I write it down if I want to analyze it. If I want to get, like, the mechanic of it, understand, I don't know, harmonic ideas or rhythmic ideas a bit better. But other than that, I think... That's a part of the job that for many students is like the final goal, you know, to write it down. But I, I always encourage them and I say, no, no, guys, this is your starting point. When you have finished, transcribed it, that's when you start to learn, to, to bring, you know, the hay into the barn. Yeah, for me, there's a specific reason why I write it down, and it's not necessarily because of that, because I can memorize a solo easily if I listen to it. Yeah. 
but I want to put it down to for two or three reasons that are musical. The first thing I want to um I want to put it down to and really try to notate as close as possible even when it's not possible I have my own conventions that people probably this says you're crazy but it just I do it for myself yeah. that tell me about where exactly that note is falling on the beat because a lot of transcription I see are, you know, like especially the 16th note, and it's not where it really falls. Yeah, you know? mean, the, the approximation rhythm. that you need to, to have now, if you write it down is unbelievable. It's almost impossible to notate, but it's very important to remember when you memorize, especially if you, if you sing it. So I develop... Um, I'm, I'm a, a whole crazy math. If you see my transcription, I do everything at hand. They look crazy because I go like, a drrr, I don't know, yes. like back. Da, da, da. And, and the second reason is um, the articulation. Um, the articulation that goes with the pronunciation. So, for example, you know, I, I mark um, dynamics and if, if I think that a note is slightly slurred, uh, how a note is approached, uh, if there's a little, often in, in the horns, maybe if, there, if I hear that there's just a little, you know, mouth or tongue pro propulsion of the note, because I want to, you know, then with the voice, I have to find a way, you know, because I'm not doing it with the same instrument. It's usually yeah. horns or piano. So that's why my transcription look exactly crazy. And it's like a million, I don't know, a million strange things. But, but that's the most important thing for me. So, um, and this uh, is before I, I start putting lyrics to it or, or, you know, start singing it. The articulation and, and the pronunciation and the way the phrase uh, has some accent inside the phrase so this is all very very important to me more than um, more than just the notes yes. you know the, the, <clears throat> there is so the much you know behind every note that is played yeah. in this music that of course yeah. just the notation itself just tells us one piece of information which is the pitch yeah. and a sort of approximate placement into the beat, which is not exactly. And you can you can only approximate it when you write it down, but when you sing it, it better be it, yes. or it ain't nothing. That's yes. the point. So I really go crazy with that, and I try to really to, to do this uh, and. You know, if I have to do the notation to notate it as close as possible so I can start getting into it and then remember it and yeah. learn it that way. That's you, uh, a mistake of that. <laughs> you touched a, a, a very important thing, a very critical thing with transcription. And uh, I also noticed that on like your social media pages, you post a lot of tracks that are not singers and most of of the tracks that you post often are like saxophone players or trumpet players so like horn players and and this is another important fact like even you know i play the, the saxophone but i sometimes transcribe of course other instruments including voice um but I remember that, for example, if I transcribe Miles, uh, all those little inflections that Miles plays are really difficult to be reproduced on the tenor. But the work that I have to throw in, and it's, it's a sort of a journey towards sound, expanding you know, my palette, on, on tone colors, for example. And there is uh, that Miles Davis solo on All of You. Mm -hmm. uh, and 
there is uh, towards the end of the solo he plays a sort of bluesy line and it took me ages to get it right I don't, I don't know if I can get it now but <laughs> it plays that note uh, and it's sort of you know swallowed in the in the trumpet. It's not a full sound note. Yeah. And I I spent you know hours to try to get that note. And, and actually, you know, that's a vocal inflection because Miles has a lot of this vocal inf inflection. Yeah. I I took down a lot of Miles. It, he does it a lot. If you, I mean, you know that. Green Dolphin Street, the legendary one with Train and Cannibal, just yeah. from the first, uh, he does some of like that. I, I'm i familiar with what you're talking about because it's, it's, it's something that he does. It's a vocal inflection. I, I mark it for myself because I noticed it too. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I just marked it as a, I put, I put a round circle in, up that note. But just, just to tell you, that's, that's a note that I pay yeah. attention to. And then I try to listen and see how that's actually, yeah. Yeah, and the concept is that, of course, like specifically on that track, I also transcribe whole train. And mm -hmm. for obvious reasons, it's easier to reproduce uh, the, the, the sound that Coltrane plays because he played on tenor. So when <laughs> Coltrane plays... <laughs> That's a bit easier because I, I can feel, oh, so probably this is the way. But because Mars plays the trumpet, I have to be creative also in approaching the saxophone in a different way. Same. So yeah. I, can, I can, like, for example, move a little bit or change my embouchure to get, you know, that inflection in the sound. Or I can use my fingers to try to slide that note up, which is not something that you hear a, a pure saxophone player uh, doing. So uh, that, but that's the part fun of, of it. Philosophy. No, but that's the fun of it. For me, it's the fun yes. of it. Uh, if it's just notes uh, uh, that, that you have to mark down, then it's not. there's so many, so many more things, and you learn a lot from that. And there's something else, too, um, that I noticed. Well, of course, the human voice is kind of, the archetypal instrument that, that the man-made instruments are referring to. Probably the man probably built his first instrument to imitate the human sound. So it's kind of something that ties it all. But, but it also has to do with the, the personality, talking about horn players especially, the personality of, of the horn players. For example, for me, eh, I'm talking about being vocalist. I don't know, probably you being a tenorist, it's, it's probably the same. But for me, there are so, uh, some uh, specific uh, giants, among these giants, that are more, um, you know, whose, whose sound is more deliberately vocal, and for some mysterious, for example, Cannonball Adderley. Okay, get me when I say this. It's not easy, but I want to say it's very easy, but not, but it's very natural translates on the voice. It's like, it just goes, you know, that's, that's all even on that. It's like, it goes up to that. That's all it goes up to A flat and it's so easy. You know, it's it's easy in the sense natural, not easy. Eh? But I want to yeah. say it, it's almost like it's built for the voice. A lot of things of Cannonball Adderley are like that. Um, I'm transcribing that there now. <laughs> wow. And it's so vocal. It's a it's really a the way the passages are structured. It just goes in in the in the can of the voice in the in the in the pipe so easily. Other alto saxophonists are different. Bird is different, but it's like it's 
it's it's it's not, it doesn't have that you know golden facility it's 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 different but it's worth it to to study but there are it, it depends on on the um, on the same instrument on the soloist mm. benny carter i love benny carter and uh, i wish i had that focus that the sound of benny carter has there's something in the center of the sound it's a, i always love that it's like ah uh, so there's yeah. not a, there's not only the phrasing there's not only there's also the sound and whatever attracts us towards a, a soloist is is um so it's not the conceptual thing it's it's emotional yes but i mean we are constantly touching in in this podcast constantly touching the point that it's all about basically the sound of it or sound and time you know i had another guest in one of the previous episodes and he told me like every time i transcribe my sound and time gets better mm -hmm. and that's great you know it's a, it's a big statement and but it's true it's true because you you start relating to something that is not scientific, not necessarily scientific. Yeah. Right? It's it's more a vibration, it's more a, a feeling that you can develop, that you can explore on yourself. And like for example, what always um, strikes me is that there are some players that to me are easier probably the same thing that you yeah. said about totally. Cannonball and some mm -hmm. other players that are not difficult in terms that they are playing more difficult stuff but mm -hmm. for me I struggle with them I struggle to, to yeah. get the right vibe into it and you know this is also the beauty of arts that we bring yeah. not only our mind, but there is everything about ourselves in, in what we do within the arts. So that's great. Now, uh, Roberta, if I can, I would like to ask you a little bit about the process. So a li little bit mm -hmm. more of the practical stuff, okay. which might help our listeners to start <laughs> trying and enjoying, you know, uh, transcribing. So, what is your methodology? Do you use any software or you just uh, take, I don't know, one line and you write it down or you first memorize the whole sort of... So can you talk to us a little bit about how you do a transcription? Usually when I start doing the transcription is I have um, already... Um, familiarity with the solo otherwise I wouldn't do it. because for me it's you know I do it mostly for the purpose of writing lyrics and then or trying to see if it can translate on the voice so so usually I have a, a familiarity maybe I know the general roadmap uh, by memory for having listened to it many times so when I start to I do not use software not even in the fast things. I, for some reason, it disturbs me. Even I took down train solo with other sheets of sound. I prefer to do it very slowly, uh, you know, like two bars at a time, but, but not use... Um, maybe they have better softwares now. I don't know. Back in when I was working <laughs> as a transcriber, there was a program. It was 20 years ago, though, but I didn't like it. So I ended up doing everything by ear. Um, I usually go phrase by phrase, period, musical period by phrase. So if it's a horn, I look at where, where the phrase starts and goes, meaning where after which the soloist takes the breath. So, yeah. And so I, I do phrase by phrase and being careful of the shape of the phrase, but, I, but by ear. And after you get one phrase, do you write it down immediately? Okay. Because I want to also catch the shape of the, along with the phrase, I try to catch the shape of the phrase, the way, the way one note goes into the other. And I already start with my crazy notes. 
like you know, I don't know, the 16th note is a little bit swallowed, and that other one has yeah. a slight accent, and here I hear. So I start immediately to tune into that. We should. I'm now having this idea. We should develop like a sort of advanced notation for transcribers, you know, and then we we could create a, a set of fonts to be used on Sibelius or Finale you know, uh, for for transcribers where you, know, you can. Uh, it's such a. It's at this point is. I think it's such a individual, personal thing. So yes. I have my own system. I have my yeah. own symbols. But I don't know, I'm not sure it would, you know, other people maybe might be comfortable. I think every person could, that's a possibility, and, and it could be the fun of it. Every person could devise their own way. There's also, there's also an important thing. We're talking about transcribing, right? But the real purpose of transcribing is internalizing, so after you transcribe, I like to transcribe phrase by phrase in real, um, if possible, in real timing, not slowing it down, because it gives me more the meaning of the phrase. And possibly I try to always figure out what the soloist might have wanted to, to say with this and where it goes and how it ties to the next phrase. It's a conversation. But after I do that, I try to slow it down right away. Because then you can really hear how, you know, then you, we can talk about pitches. You can, you can do it slow, you hear this melody slowed down. And that's something that Moody used to tell me. And, Always do it slow. <laughs> and you slow it down by oh singing, yes. CC with the voice. You, that, you point. don't slow down the track. You no, 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 no. You slow down the phrase. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Because this way, I. It also, we say, singers enters in your body. Yeah. That's the ultimate thing. I, 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 this is my instrument, so I wanna, you know. But this, this is great. And to to go just a tiny little bit back to the fact that you have your own uh, signage and, and notation, it brings me back to the early music where there were melismas and. Hmm. Yeah. You had to write something uh, that used to tell the singer what was the shape around the note that you could have used, but then it, it was up to the singer or the player to flourish and to shape that melisma in a specific way. So I rephrase myself, we should start conceiving uh, like a melisma notation for transcribers. <laughs> that, that could be a new business. Could be possible. But, <laughs> we could, you know, I'm not, you know, I never, I never thought about, about it because this is a work I do for my, for my own personal growth, so yeah. to speak. And so yeah. I was, I, I was thinking maybe it works for me, but it doesn't work for others. And, no, but you, oh. This is a very important part, and if you are familiar with uh, like transcription books, uh, yeah, you, you can. If Sorry, just a second. Cause, uh, no, that's fine. Um, if yeah, that's a little bit. Um, if, if you are familiar with transcription books, there is always in the in the foreword um, or the preface there is a legenda with some signs and some alternate fingerings. I remember I, I studied a lot on the preface of uh, Michael Brecker transcription book where there are all the alternate fingerings or just, you know, little things. And whoever did that, that book simply found one way, one possible way to right, describe right. that and put an X on top of the node or uh, a circle with a with a cross in between. And then you go to the legenda, oh, okay, so I have to press this uh -huh. or, you know. So, of course, there are many ways, but it would be interesting to, uh, and it is really important that you said it because it is something that we cannot miss, you know, that you have to go that deep where you can actually create a new uh, calligraphy, 
you know, to express a bit better, not 100% spot on, yeah, but a bit better exactly. what, yeah, what the note. For, for me, the, the fun thing is that, that this teaches us is that uh, there are things that in music that are still are mysterious. <laughs> Yeah. So not everything is known conceptually, but it can only be felt. And so I think it's a, for, I, lo I love this. <laughs> it's kind yeah. of a yeah. fun things, but we can, we can definitely do it and can really try. Right. And you sort of start answering the next question, which is how do you practice this transcribed solo? So you said it that you slow it down phrase by phrase because you want to sort of digest and internalize. Internalize it, yeah. Uh, and do you have other strategies to practice the solos you transcribe? No, the only strategy is the one that that was <laughs> really taught to me directly by Moody, and he said, "Slow it down." But I mean down down like really 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 slow yeah it, that's a really interesting thing because it's it's very difficult to slow something down the same thing if, even with the themes if you do a theme by charlie parker to really learn it you have to you know otherwise they write you know you're doing nothing you you have to try to slow it down and pay attention to the accents and everything. So, no, for me, it's really slowing it down. Yeah. And then, you know, after that, for me, is I try to really focus on the story where it's, wherever it's possible to put a lyric. And so it kind of starts to take form little by little. So. Yeah, I, I remember now you make me thinking of one thing that, you know that we have very few videos of Charlie Parker available. Yeah. There is one video where he's receiving, I think, a Grammy Award. He's together with Dizzy Gillespie mm -hmm. and they, they get an, or oh, it's the downbeat uh, award for best alto player. That yeah, year. or it was it's, a metronome all stars, something like some, that. Something I, like I that. And they play a bebop tune. And I, I tried to play that tune along with him and I struggled to be precise. And then I start focusing also on his hands. And if you watch his hands, he's barely moving mm -hmm. on the on the altar. His movements on the saxophone are so so small that in the video you can almost not see them. And I tried that. So I started working, you know, even on, on my technique to try to play a scale and moving the least I can. And all of a sudden, by trying to stay almost in contact with the keys all the time, I started sounding a bit more like him. Of course, not like him. That would be great, but yeah. unfortunately, it didn't happen. But uh, so there is a also a part of the journey is also to try to be that player. Oh, gee. Is uh, also whenever it's possible, whenever a video is available, because oftentimes you know we have we transcribe from the recording, so. But whenever the video is available, yeah, it's absolutely important to look at, at the physical attitude of the soloist. I mean, just what is he doing? How is he moving? How is he standing? That, that can help. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I wanted to say one more thing in sure. regards to the process of learning, because there's more after I slow it down. Then, you know, I try to sing it in, in, in tempo, understanding the way the, the periods, the musical phrases go one into the other, like a conversation. Only at that point when I have really felt it as a conversation, then as an exercise, I want to say this to all the singers out there because I <laughs> think... As an exercise, and for me, it's a very intimate 
thing to do, I usually sing the solo on the recording while I record myself. You know what I mean? Because I want to listen back and what I am looking for is to see the points where the timing is not together. The timing. I do that mostly for the timing. Now, this is a study process. So I don't do it in front of a camera because if you do it with the purpose of showing yourself to somebody, you lose the focus and the concentration. So, and then you would easily revert to, oh, okay, I'm singing these pitches, ba 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 ba. You're not doing anything if you're singing the pitches on top of, of a recording that mm. goes. It's really nothing. So I have watched with a little bit of dismay this uh, new vogue of a lot of a lot of females also, a lot of girls, singers, girls, singing girls, uh, singing on with the, you know, the in the background of Dexter Gordon, and just singing merely da 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 da. No, that's not it. And um it's not about reproducing a pitch. It becomes mechanical and because and most of all, it's you cannot do that work while you're concerned about how you're looking in your hair. And it's, that's a different sort of thing. Mm. Once you have internal, I'm talking to, you know, the, the, the students. Once you have really internalized and you really have something to say, expressing yourself, it could be celebrating the beauty of this solo. It can be a lot of things. It can be that the solo touched some areas in you that you, you're not even quite sure what they are, but you want to just do it. These are all great motivations. But then at that point, you, you do it. You, you, you come to yourself or, you, or you, you call a friend, and, and then you do it. And at that point, you express this message to other people. But mm. the message is not the pitch it is part of it, but it's a whole different story. So if you, if you make up a whole YouTube channel with you singing, it's nice. It'll, it'll get you a lot of praise and it's beautiful, but do also that other thing. If you do only that, and then you go from one solo to the other, eh, you know, yeah. you're not going to put that to, so do one and the other. In my opinion, you know, I don't like to, I think the process of um, practicing is very personal. I personally would not video myself practicing that type of thing, especially. I'm putting it out there, but that's okay if you like to do it. But do also something else yeah. <laughs> with it. it <clears throat> I think, yeah, this, this is a big point, of course, even for, for this podcast. Uh, it uh, has also to do with the maturity you know, of the person who is doing, because I've seen also videos of people doing it and videoing themselves, and they are absolutely like carbon copied in terms of time and uh, feel. It you know, so it, so it, means, it means to me that they have done a great job there. You know, it's, it's not just the pitch, but you can hear. I always use this example. There is a bassoonist, um, who is playing uh, a Michael Brecker solo. Mm -hmm. And I love it because I can show to my students that he's able with a bassoon to reproduce right. all the Brecherism that makes Brecker Brecker. Mm -hmm. you know? And you, you can feel that on the bassoon. I have no idea whether it's difficult or not. I can only imagine to me bassoon is a mystery. So I think it could have been very, very difficult. But he's great. He's reproducing all those little colors behind the pitch. Mm -hmm. And he's perfect. He's doing a great job. Then maybe, I don't know, he's not an improviser. He's not even an improviser. I don't know his story. I should actually contact him and ask him. Uh, but another example is on the first episode of the po podcast, I had a, an Italian saxophone player and he transcribed another Brecker solo, which is the live uh, version with Steps Ahead, live version of Record Me by Joe Henderson. Uh -huh. And the whole solo is five and a half minutes. 
and he plays, you know, perfectly with him. And it was so interesting to see the video because whenever Brecher doubles the tempo and play all semi-quavers, uh, this, this guy who played the solo, he closes his eyes. Uh -huh. So to me, it means that he has internalized, you know, those lines so well that he doesn't want to, he does want to just feel that line. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's so interesting to, to also view, you know, the, the, process the ongoing process of someone else playing a solo that has learned that sometimes yes can be really mechanic and sterile i would say because you miss the whole point of it and that's a danger i i it may be maybe this danger is happens more with the voice mm. because it's such a honestly it's, it's not easy you know the, the intonation and everything so May I don't know why, but it and it should be the opposite. It should be more, you know, more human with the voice. Yep. So I don't know. <laughs> um, have you ever I felt? Have you ever felt you were copying someone? Like one of the uh, objections that sometimes I receive when I encourage people to transcribe is that, oh, but I don't want to sound like somebody else. You know, I want to sound myself, so I don't want to spend hours in trying to become someone else. Uh, so have you ever felt that way? With the transcription? Yes. I, I don't transcribe singers. <laughs> but because a lot of the solos of singers it's, it's stuff that I, I know it's easy to memorize and so and I kind of being a singer I can, I can hear the type of the type of bending of the notes you know I don't know I don't know why but I don't really transcribe although I know by memories I told you a lot of these solos I usually transcribe i mostly i only basically transcribe instrumentally so um, maybe with the voice uh, hey i wish i could copy campbell adderley <laughs> <Hey, hey. laughs> but um no actually copying for studying is is the first uh, the first step as clark terry you say copy assimilate create so copying is very important. It's not yeah. the end of, end of all, but and if you feel like I'm saying this to singers, if you feel like copying a solo of Sarah Vaughan, by all means, do that. You know, I just try to because maybe it's my case because all those solos, you know, the Lullaby of Berlin, the Shulia Baba, I I was bad at singing them, memorizing them when I was little. So I was really more interested in, in trying something a little bit different. But, but by all means, do that. It's, it's um, just yeah. pay attention yeah. to the usual thing, sound, time. And do you have any specific strategy on how to incorporate the ideas on the solos that you transcribe into your own improvisation or your own playing? Well, the the thing that usually should should happen if if <laughs> hopefully hopefully is that these ideas then should seep unconsciously in your in your plane and I'm being a singer you know I don't I don't do a whole gig where I scat for two hours you know but it will it will get in your way of expressing even if you sing a theme. Yeah, it will definitely, but it does by itself. And it will come out That's, when the time is right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, in my absolutely. experience, it's never uh, right if I do it consciously, like, oh, here I can play that leak of, you know, Harold Land. 
No, I no. always fail if I do that. But sometimes it just comes out. And then after I did it, I said, was it a heron land line? Oh, yeah. And I didn't do it consciously. So it's, it's somewhere. It's, it's ready to go. Yeah. But it, it waits like uh, the, the right time to come up. Yeah. So that's yeah, absolutely that's true. That's the whole purpose of it. It's so that you then don't think and, and kind of. Yeah. Now, uh, you showed me before we we started recording the episode. You showed me a folder with I don't know hundreds <laughs> of <laughs> solos, and that's that's really impressive. Uh, so I get to the next question, which is the dumbest question on on this podcast. But I I feel that I have to ask to all my guests. Uh, do you have a favorite solo? that you have transcribed and if yes i mean of course you don't have only one but if i force you gently to pick one uh, could you tell us why you picked that one you know i have a favorite solo but i never transcribe it i just know it, it maybe so are you scared that if you transcribe it you don't like it anymore no, it's just something that's always in my mind, you know, something that listen and it's John Coltrane solo um you know, blue and green all okay. kind of Yeah. But is that 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 one is probably the greatest solo, one of the greatest, the most beautiful and I don't know. Why? You think so? Because uh, because it's uh transcend uh, I don't know there's something different in that um, it is so uh, I don't know it's got something uh, maybe it's just my my emotional connection to it but it's something that even tra it's a solo beyond a solo I don't know it's just a, maybe it's like a art of the fugue of Bach it's like absolute music. It's not even anymore a soul. It's not even anymore jazz. It's just something. It's the music of the spheres to me. Wow. I don't know. I mean, wow. it's something. So maybe that's why, you know, I, I just, I'm so, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I couldn't even, I mean, I, I, I hear it inside. But yes. No, yes. It's just something. Oh. Uh, that's great. Yeah. That's great. And is there an artist that, to you, it was more difficult than anyone else. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Lester Young. Oh. <laughs> so, just uh, the, the last work I did that was published with Vocalies was um, three years ago. I did, I did a participation on an album of Emanuele Cisi, yep. Italian saxophone player. And he called me and said, you know, I would like to do this album dedicated to Lester Young, but really the, um, I was so inspired by reading this book of poems written on, dedicated to Lester Young, No Eyes, you know, which is, was an expression of Lester. And uh, so he said, I would like, if possible, for, um, for you to somehow adapt some of these verses of this poet to one of the solos of Lester Young, which is the famous, you know, these foolish things, you know, yeah. which is a solo that had already a set of lyrics, I believe, I mean, I remember Eddie Jefferson sang it, kind of something like Baby Girl, but he wanted, and these, these verses were really stunning. So what I did, of course, as usual, I, I transcribed the solo. And I thought, hey, you know, these foolish things, you know, Lester Young, beautiful, you know, blah, blah, blah. But I wasn't, that was the most difficult thing I ever did. My God, you know, like I want to beat myself on the head for, I understood so much diving into the solo about, I mean, I think I understood, maybe I didn't, but. You know, I really understood, I, I thought I understood where Wayne Shorter comes from because, I mean, it's, a, it's my, this solo is mind boggling. 
<laughs> I mean, I had had the same the same effect also on a lot of solos of Bird, um, but this solo with all the it, harmonically, the choice of it is so freaking advanced. I don't know how to explain. And, and I was like, he made it sound so smooth and easy that you are not aware of the mind-boggling complexity of the solo. I mean, really, look at that. <laughs> like, yeah. 37,000. My God, this was, wow. You know, Lester Young, unbelievable. That was really, really difficult. Difficult in a positive way, but yeah. it blew my mind on so many levels. It's Afro tourism. It's more modern than a, than modern. Yeah, really. I, I think I spent few months on Lester's vibrato, and I'm still yeah. not still not yeah. successful on just one thing. Just the vibrato is so original, so unpredictable as well that you know to you have to study a lot to be able to. Yes, unpredictable. Get also. See, see, he had the same thing that Billie Holiday had, which is, he's somewhere also time-wise, the phrases start always not exactly where you would expect it. Yes. It's, so, it's like, but beyond that also, the, it's so modern, the way it's constructed, the way the, sh the phrase is constructed, the re his relationship with harmony too is unique. And also this famous, you know, laid back, which is not really laid back, but it's, a kind of scomposizione, we say, of time, yeah, where there's yeah. a lot of polyrhythm underneath going on. It's not spelled out. Because you don't get that just by laying back. You have to really work. I, I, I still, I look at this and like, I don't know how. How is it possible to? It's a, it's a Mount Rushmore for me, the solo for, 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 for real. So yeah, that's the most difficult thing. <laughs> yeah, I think Lester Young is a great way to end this episode. Uh, so thanks so much, Roberta. It has been really a pleasure. Uh, and uh, I'm pretty sure all our listeners will enjoy a lot listening to your tips and your experience in regard to transcription. So all the best of luck and I'll stay in touch and we need to talk about that business of creating yes, um, melisma do notation yeah, <laughs> for, yeah, why not? for jazz transcribers. <laughs> so I wish you all the best and of course I will uh, post all the links to your websites and your links or where to find Roberta's music in the podcast description and uh, we'll hear in the next episode bye 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 thank you so much Mirko bye bye ciao everybody